Good morning. My name's Chad Nita. I'm the president of the Tri-State Denver Buddhist Temple. Uh, on behalf of the Tri-State Denver Buddhist Temple, I'd like to welcome you to this year's uh, interfaith service. Uh, we're very proud to be hosting the interfaith service with everything that's been happening in the world. Uh, we think it's really important that we get the opportunity to come together. And interfaith, this interfaith service is maybe the best example and one of the things we're the proudest to participate in. It's an opportunity for all of us to uh, reflect and uh, think about our circumstances, think about the people that we love, and to recognize that we're all in the same situation together and that it's going to take all of us coming together to keep moving forward. So thank you again for joining us.
Good morning, Denver Interfaith Community, and happy Thanksgiving. My name is Reverend Mike Moran. I serve the First Unitarian Church here in central Denver, and First Unitarian is proud to continue our long tradition of participating in the annual Interfaith Thanksgiving service on this annual secular holiday. One of the things I get asked pretty frequently, and sometimes even on my way out of the annual interfaith thanksgiving service is just what is a unitarian diversalist person um, and i'm happy to answer that question i understand it's a lot of syllables unitarian universalism 13 to be exact um, in fact we're relatively small on the larger scheme of religion in america barely even qualifying as what would be called mainstream the very short version of who we are, Unitarian Universalists, is that there are two pillars to our history, the Unitarian side and the Universalist side, both of which come out of the Protestant Reformation. The early Unitarians were people in the 15 and 1600s who didn't feel that the Christian doctrine of the Trinity was biblically justified. They felt that Christian scripture more accurately interpreted uh, was that Jesus was a child of God rather than co-equal to God and very possibly a child of God in the same way that all of us are the children of God. They felt that whatever God was, what we like to call the mystery at the heart of the universe these days, uh, that it made more sense to think of that mystery, the source of all things, as a unity rather than as a trinity, and that's how they got the name Unitarian. At the time, both Protestants and Catholics proclaimed Unitarianism a heresy, and uh, being a public Unitarian could and did get you burned at the stake back there in the 1500s. The other side of the tradition, Universalism, also came out of a scriptural interpretation. The early Universalists didn't feel that hell was biblically justified, especially in light of Jesus. They questioned the logic of original sin and quoted passages like Romans chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, referring to Adam there, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all, referring to Jesus, that is. They felt that God was love and that every human soul, every last one of them, was a creation of God, so that every human soul, every last one of them, would ultimately be reconciled with God. Universal salvation, no exceptions, hence the name universalist. These days... If you were to come to this beautiful sanctuary here at 14th and Lafayette in Denver, uh, you would see banners on our walls that proclaim there is a unity that makes us one. And that is a reference to the Unitarian side of our tradition. And you would see another banner that reads, all souls are sacred and worthy. And that is a reference to the Universalist side of our tradition. Like every tradition, we strive to be faithful to our tradition and to our covenant with each other, 
And like every tradition, sometimes we fall short. I think that's why we have a church and a covenant. So thank you to the Denver interfaith community. Thank you to the Tri-State Buddhist Temple for hosting and assembling the uh, online uh, thanks, interfaith Thanksgiving service this year. Thank you for this opportunity to share a little bit of who we are and the spiritual sources of our perseverance in this world. Whoever you are on this Thanksgiving day, may you experience as much connection and love as you can stand. Amen. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm Pastor Kanan Harris of Central Christian Church, and we are so grateful that we can join again together this year for our annual Interfaith Thanksgiving service. And I want to give a special thanks to Reverend Caitlin and the Denver Tri-State Buddhist Temple for lending us their technological expertise that we can have this service again this year, this time in the virtual space. Because if you're like me, this is something that you look forward to each and every Thanksgiving, that this has become a part of your annual Thanksgiving tradition. I've been the pastor at Central Denver since 2007, and so each year I look forward to this as one of my most favorite annual events, and I so enjoy the friendships that we have built amongst our interfaith mission partners here in this city that uh, continue throughout the year. I know I have two children that I've raised here in Denver, Colorado, and for them it wouldn't be Thanksgiving if we didn't get together at 10 o'clock on Thanksgiving morning and, and join with our interfaith mission partners. So we give all thanks and praise. And you may not know this, but at Central we remember that it was one of our ministers, Brother J.H. McCullough, who founded this interfaith thanksgiving service along with partners from temple emmanuel and other faith communities way back in the 1880s when denver was just the wild west frontier and so each time we gather we remember all of those who have gone before we remember that those walk this road ahead of us that we stand on their shoulders and that we are not facing any trials that are greater than what those have faced in the generations that came before. This is where we find our strength, that we are not alone, that we can look back to all those who have gone before and we can trust that uh, God got them through those very trials and circumstances, that uh, God will get us through the trials and circumstances that we are facing this day and that we can trust in that hope, that we can trust in the, the strength that comes from our faith, that we can trust that God will not give us more than we can handle. And even more, it seems to us that we are finding these very trials and circumstances as an opportunity to rise to the occasion. I don't know about you, but at Central Christian Church, we've been worshiping online for these past nine months. And what we're finding in this time is that the church is not a building, but a people. We call our, our program Worship From Home, Church Without Walls, and we are truly learning how to be the community of faith outside the walls of our building. Worshiping God and encouraging each other, strengthening one another as iron sharpens iron, and even doing the work of, of mission and outreach in this city of Denver and around the world. So our experience is that these challenges are bringing out the best of us, that these challenges are allowing us to, to think outside the box and that we can trust that God will not give us more than we can handle. Indeed, why would God save us from drowning just to beat us to death on the seashore? So we trust in a power that is greater than ourselves and we are so grateful that we can join together with our interfaith mission partners here in the city of Denver to strengthen one another, to encourage one another, not only on this Thanksgiving day, but along this journey of life. So we persevere and we continue to persevere in these times, just as all those persevered who came before us and 
on this Thanksgiving day, I like to look back and, and think of all those pioneers, of all those who met the challenges of their day and who found the strength and the encouragement and hope to, to keep walking along this journey of life. And that is my prayer, that we will find that strength, that we can strengthen one another, another that we can trust that there is a power greater than ourselves, regardless of our tradition, and that we can find hope for the journey. This is my prayer for all of us this Thanksgiving day. Thanks be to God. Amen. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما كان لنفس أن تموت إلا بإذن الله كتابا مؤجلا ومن يرد ثواب الدنيا نؤته منها ومن يرد ثواب الآخرة نؤته منها وسنجزي الشاكرين صدق الله العظيم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين سيجي يرتان اللهم بنيدا شكسب سيدك لرين تشند بنا داير بر سعي يرتان اللهم بنيدا شكسب سعيدك لرين تشند بنا داير بر سن رحمن سن اللهم رحيم وغنسم أسر جينسين اللهم باشلا ينسم سن رحمن سن اللهم رحيم وغنسم أسر جينسين اللهم باشلا ينسن تشكر ادريم اللهم سني شوك سفيورم اللهم تشكر ادريم اللهم سني شوك سفيورم اللهم Dear friends attending the annual interfaith Thanksgiving service. Thanksgiving is a beautiful fall holiday. As beautiful as dancing colors of leaves, delicious as a taste of fresh apple, converting a smell of coffee, and poetic as our nostalgic memories and traditions. Yes, 2020 brought many challenges, which deeply impacted our lives on all levels and aspects our physical and mental health, our emotions, finance, education, our social and cultural life, and our freedom. Yet, it made us realize the things we take for granted, contemplate the meaning of our existence, and remind us the importance of gratitude and our community in our lives. And I believe these three are the heart of our Thanksgiving. Well, although Thanksgiving is not a religious holiday, it 
carries many profoundly religious and spiritual meanings. According to the Quran, all human beings are from the same soul, but they have been created with differences. Times like Thanksgiving help us to remember how we belong together and harmonize in such a way that celebrates each one's hue. What better time to bring together from diverse faith and cultures to give thanks together. Sometimes I feel like Muslims celebrate <laughs> 29 day Thanksgiving in Ramadan. As Muslim, being thankful is essential part of my faith. The chronic word for thanks and gratitude is shukr, and it's mentioned in Quran several times. Allah says in the Quran, if you are grateful, I will surely increase you in favor. Allah has described in Quran his prophets, his messengers, and nobles among those who were thankful people. For us, shukr is not a religious act or service, but the whole life. It's a full-time occupation. We are tasked to use the blessings that are bestowed upon us in a way that benefits the humanity, the universe, and it pleases Allah. We are thankful to Allah for innumerable blessings. And a phrase Muslims often use to show their gratitude is Alhamdulillah, which means praise belongs to Allah. We are not only asked to thank Allah, but we are also told to thank our families, our friends, our neighbors, our loved ones, and all those who do any good to us. The Prophet said, those who do not thank people, they do not thank Allah. Well, as Americans gather around Thanksgiving tables, virtually or in person today, it's a moment to celebrate and reflect on the bounties of God, express our gratitude to Him, and celebrate our common humanity and our colorful differences. People from all faith and political persuasions are able to put aside their differences and engage in dialogue, reminding them that the world is large, humanity is diverse, and that every human being has inherent value and something special to offer. On this day, we pray that God, most merciful, provide food, shelter, and clothing to those who are hungry homeless or otherwise in poverty through the generosity in the hearts of the neighbors and the fellow citizens. For those who are suffering from disease or strife, may God end their sufferings and provide them comfort. We pray to God to bless America and the world and give us the strength to promote its institutions of democracy, racial and economic justice and peace. We pray to God to give us the courage to promote diversity and resist all kinds of discriminations, whether based on religion, race, ethnicity, country of origin, language, culture, class, sexual orientation, identity, gender, and ability. As stewards for our planet, we pray for the healing of our earth for future generations may enjoy the beauty of it. And we pray for a better world and beautiful tomorrows. As a Mosaic family, we're sending you all our best wishes for a happy Thanksgiving. Every year, it's uh, by tradition, we um, sponsor a particular, uh, we find a particular charity in the community um, to sponsor. And we ask everyone who attends the interfaith ceremony uh, to put their donations toward helping um, a particular charity. And that's something that, as the host organization, we have the honor of selecting um, a group called Struggle of Love. And you'll find uh, a link at the bottom of your screen that will allow you to make donations um, to this group that we think is a really important organization and doing terrific work in the community. And we'd like to uh, take a moment to play a video that they prepared so they can tell you a little bit more about themselves. We got fresh carrots, we got squash, we got, I mean, look, nectarines. I mean, look what God is giving away. 
Look what God has provided for the community. So we have our, our Spreading Our Love Mentoring Leadership Program. And also, we do multiple community outreach events throughout the year. This will be our 14th year of Father's Day Reach for Peace picnic coming up, which we trade it to a parade. Then also, we do our uh, annual toy drive giveaway. Um, so, uh, and then we also like the violence interruption, violence interrupters and uh, secondary prevention for this far northeast Denver area. And then of course, uh, everybody knows about the food pantry, right? The food pantry has become a, 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 a necessity uh, that we never seen. I'm grateful. Uh, for a couple of weeks now, I take to my neighbors that don't have vehicles that have little children and uh, to a couple of old folks that live by me that are, they're not mobile like I am. But this is a great help, it's office. Problems getting all up in your face. Hello, my name is Father Vitol. I'm a parochial vicar at Christ the King Parish here in Denver, Colorado. And uh, I would like to talk to you about uh, how from the Catholic point of view, we understand perseverance and uh, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving. And actually Thanksgiving, that's a, a really great word for us uh, the Catholics and for all of us, I guess, but still Thanksgiving is really connected to the most important uh, thing, sacrament is how we call it in the Catholic church, the Eucharist. The Eucharist are the celebrated here every day and especially on Sundays, uh, Eucharist, it's, uh, it's a Greek word, Eucharistia, and it means thanksgiving, thanksgiving. Uh, thanksgiving to God, thanksgiving to, to people that we love and thanksgiving to, uh, to everyone who is really connected in, in our human family because Jesus who became uh, one of us, one of us, God who became one of us, uh, comes to us every day in the Eucharist and that's why we want to thank him, thank him. Uh, it requires perseverance. Why? Because we need to really struggle from Monday uh, to Sunday, but God intended this day on uh, Sunday just as a specific day to come here and thank him uh, from the bottom of, of our hearts. And uh, because uh, some of you know that I was studying physics, I love numbers and, 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 and formulas. So I was even thinking about this uh, approach when we thank God in all our different you know, religion uh, perspective. But still, uh, it reminds me that if we take Sunday as one of the seven, uh, seven days uh, within the week, uh, God requires us, the Catholics in this case, uh, to come to the church on Sunday. And usually the Mass, the Eucharist, takes uh, one hour. One hour. Uh, one hour uh, is just one hour, but uh, seven days, it's 168 uh, hours. Uh, and so one of 168 is not even 1% of our week. This is what uh, God, uh, through the Catholic Church, tells us that uh, every Catholic should should come to the church uh, on Sunday uh, to really give thanks, give thanks, say thank you for what uh, you know have happened uh, throughout the week, and ask for uh, grace and strength to really do our best uh, this coming six days. So then, every seventh day we come here to give him thanks and uh, really ask for this kind of perseverance, so we can really go through our week, uh, our lives, and then uh, come here and thank him every, every Sunday. It reminds me that uh, Thanksgiving uh, this year is a specific one because of COVID and because of uh, our struggles and, uh, and you know, politics and, and so on. But we need to really look at uh, you know, our religion uh, as Catholics and then as any other uh, you know, uh, tradition that we have here in our country, but we need to really look at our God and uh, tell him, we thank you, we thank you. And I think we really need this kind of approach uh, in these days uh, when there is so much struggle, there is so much uh, fight uh, uh, everywhere in the world. And we really want to uh, say thank you and specific today on Thanksgiving day, uh, thank our God and thank uh, those whom we love, our family members, friends, 
and so on and tell him tell them all of them but we we really thank you we love you and this is what we are supposed to do uh, each and every day uh, to thank god uh, for uh, what what happens in our lives even in the midst of the struggle even in the midst of COVID, even in the midst of of, of crisis economical crisis as well but we do our best we thank god and with this kind of perseverance we can really go forward and do our best, do our best each and every day, because this is what we are called to do, to do our best. No matter if we're Catholic, if we're Lutheran, if we're Jewish, if we're Buddhist, if we're any other religion, uh, we are still human beings. We are still human beings. And we are supposed to do our best when we thank God, when we go through each and every day uh, with this kind of strength that comes from our uh, religions, and if we do so, if we do so, we can really improve our culture, we can really improve our society, and we can improve uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, because this is what it's all about. Uh, being thankful, yes, and specific on this day, uh, being thankful to uh, our God, uh, because in God uh, we trust and we do our best each and every day to, to tell him, thank you so much and help us to do our best uh, tomorrow. Thank you so much. Have a good um, uh, Thanksgiving day. And uh, together, as I can say, as I said, we can do our best. And so I pray for all of you that we will do our best and we will go, we will go through this uh, crisis, through the COVID uh, world, and we will, we, will see, we will see better tomorrow. Thank you so much and have a good uh, Thanksgiving day. God bless you. Shalom. Good morning. Welcome to our Thanksgiving celebration. My name is Rabbi Yvette. I'm the spiritual leader of B'nai Chavara, Denver Jewish Reconstructionist Congregation. Now, our synagogue has been a member of this gathering for many years. For my contribution this year, I would like to bring a message of hope for 2020. We have been through the ringer this year. All of us. As a starting point, I wanted to summarize what many of us might be feeling. Since my wife is a chef, it dawned on me that I could best express my feelings in the form of a recipe card. So here it is. Recipe for the dish, Meltdown 2020. Crack two eggs and add them to a pot full of extremely divisive election. Put that on the stove on medium heat. Throw in rushed replacement of a dearly beloved Supreme Court justice. Mix in one bottle of racism aged in caskets for 200 years. Season mixture with first date is on fire. Cover pot and bring to a boil. In a separate pan, stir fry one pandemic and oil of xenophobia. Add to boiling pot mixture. Replace cover tightly. Cook for 365 days. Allow to cool. Garnish with homophobia. Serves 331 million people. Dark. I know. Fed a steady, steady diet of Meltdown 2020. It's no wonder so many of our fellow citizens in the United States are malnourished, spiritually undernourished, emotionally undernourished. We have experienced and are experiencing now a level of animosity, hatred, and bigotry the likes of which we haven't seen since the Civil War. And I guess I should speak for myself at this point. I feel betrayal. I am afraid, and sometimes I panic. I actually thought those feelings would dissipate after the election, but they haven't. 
I'm cracked wide open and undefended. I feel like I imagine Jacob felt in the book of Genesis as he fled his family and his brother. But Jacob fled his brother's anger, urged to flee by his parents. How betrayed he must have felt. How alone and how afraid. Exhausted at nightfall, so exhausted that he laid his head down on a stone for a pillow. When Jacob fell asleep, he dreamed of a ladder reaching up to the sky. The angels ascending and descending on this ladder into heaven. There's a whole lot you can say about that ladder. But right now, I'd like to focus on the point when Jacob wakes up from his dream. He said, Yesh Elohim. God was in this place. God was physically in this place. And I did not know it. I've always read Jacob's words as an expression of regret. Regret that by remaining asleep during that slice of time, he had missed a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be present with the sacred. I wonder, is that us? Are we so tired of turning around, afraid of facing each other, or so apathetic that we are asleep, passing by holy opportunity for healing and growth? Is that us? There is another way of interpreting the Hebrew phrase from that passage of the Bible. Yesh Elohim, God is, present tense, Bama Komaza, in this place. Yesh Elohim, God, sacred opportunity, lives in this place right here. This emotional and spiritual place where, yes, we are afraid. Growth, the possibility of salvation, lies in this makom, this place where we don't have the words to begin and where we lack the courage to turn around and try. I'd like to suggest that the fact that we are exhausted, cracked in half, is not a reason for despair, but a reason for hope. Every kind of holy opportunity is right here in this moment. The poet Roshani Rea urges us to cherish the broken places inside of us. There in that broken place, the poet says, lies the truest and most precious part of us. When Moses went up to Mount Sinai to receive the second set of tablets, he justifiably requested to see God's face and God said, I'm going to put you in a broken place. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock, and only then will you see my goodness pass by. So let us have hope. Let us not be afraid to live in our own broken places. And with regard to the broken places of others, let us have hope and not be afraid to look at their pain and their fear. And let us have hope that we can make decisions derived from really listening, to gain understanding, from understanding, move to acting, from acting to making sure that we are achieving what is in our mutual best interests. I think that is Thanksgiving story and Thanksgiving message. People from extremely different walks of life can get together, help each other, and break bread together. And speaking of bread, you know, usually when we have this interfaith Thanksgiving service, we pass out baskets full of bread. But there's a special recipe for the baskets. Each basket is not complete until it has portions of bread representing each faith and culture present. 
And you know what? I've never seen anyone reach into that basket for their own bread, preferring theirs over someone else's. A blessing of gratitude for you. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam. Blessed are you, source of grace. Asher Kitshanu Bamitzvotav Vitzivanu, who in wisdom has commanded us. Al Hakarat Atov. To recognize the good in each opportunity. Chag Sameach, happy holiday. May you each be sitting at a table filled with happiness. May you be warm, safe, and feel love. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm Andy Dunning. I'm the pastor at University Park United Methodist Church. And on behalf of our faith community, I want to extend our thanks for the opportunity to be part of this online service. Bethany Hader Krabs, our director of wholeness and healing ministries, has a scripture reading to offer from the biblical book of James. This comes from James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 and verses 22 through 25. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let that endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word, and not doers, They are like those who look at themselves in the mirror, for they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in the doing. I love that passage from James for the way that it ties our interior life to our actions. James says that unless we practice our faith, unless we act on it, we're like people who look in a mirror and then forget what we look like as soon as we turn around. Without practicing our faith, we forget the image of God. We forget the true self in us. In his example, James lifts up the practice of humility and service, but I think it's equally true for the spiritual practice of thanksgiving. If we forget to practice gratitude, if we forget to give thanks regularly, we're like those people who turn from the mirror and forget who we are. We forget the image of God in us. Jesus tells us that the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are as little children. So to remind ourselves of the power of giving thanks, even in chaotic and difficult times, we asked some of our congregation's children and youth to share what they're thankful for. And we want to share their answers with you now. In this unusual time, here are some of the things I'm thankful for. Masks, toilet paper, nurses and doctors, they keep us safe and healthy. Firefighters, police officers, and USPS workers. How else would we get all our packages? Farmers, bus drivers, and teachers, they keep our education going. Child care, grocery store workers, and community health workers. And most of all, I'm thankful for the scientists who are working hard to find a vaccine. Hello, I am Charles Rankin. No matter who you are, there will always be something or someone that you are thankful for. Sometimes you may not even notice that you are thankful for some possession or person. Two things I am very thankful for are my family and my friends, because they are always there to stand for my rights and beliefs, as well as fight for them. Without demonstrating a trait of gratitude or thankfulness, humans would be so much more boring and less advanced. Our ability to work together may as well be the greatest and most beautiful traits, trait that human can show. 
Hi, we are Zach, Daniel, and Abby, and this thing, and we are from University Park United Methodist Church. And this Thanksgiving, we are grateful for a lot of things. Me personally, I'm grateful that we can still do church online and be, be able to see each other in some way. And I'm also grateful that sports are still on in some way also, and that I can still play a lot of the sports that I was playing before the pandemic. And I'm also very grateful for all the support friends and family have had throughout this whole pandemic. I'm grateful for all of the support that U Park has had for us. Um, I'm also grateful for Moina Hudgens because I've been pen palling with her. Um, and then I'm also thankful for our school and all of the help that they've been doing with online learning. And I'm grateful for each week we have church and we can talk with all of our other church members throughout the live chat. And I'm grateful to have been able to hang out with my friends and family. And I'm also, we're all, we're all grateful for Ozzy. Our dog. Ozzy, come here. Ozzy, look Happy at Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Having heard from our congregation's children, I pray that we can all give thanks in that spirit every day. Personally, I'm thankful that our congregation is part of a vibrant interfaith community right here in Denver, a community in which we can encourage one another in our respective spiritual practice, a community in which we can learn from one another to better understand each other, to better understand ourselves, and to lift up the shared values that we hold. As the Apostle Paul writes, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Happy Thanksgiving from University Park United Methodist Church. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. My name is Cantor Elizabeth Sachs, and I am the senior cantor at Temple Emmanuel in Denver. I'm going to share with you a story today for all of our kids who are watching and listening. We are going to read a story called Bagels from Benny. Who likes bagels? I love bagels. Let's find out what Benny does with his bagels. The sun was just waking up when Benny ran downstairs to visit his grandfather's bakery. He always helped grandpa before he went to school. He swept the floor, show me how you sweep the floor, sweep, 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 and dusted the shelves, dust, 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 dust. And then he put all the bagels and the buns in the bins. Plop, plop, plop. Everybody loved Benny's grandfather's bagels, because Benny's grandfather baked the best bagels in town. So crusty outside, Mrs. Silver said. So soft inside, added Mr. Gold. You put love in your bagels, said Mrs. Green. Thank you so much. Grandpa handed Mrs. Green a bag full of bagels and said, why should you thank me? Mrs. Green laughed and said, well, who else would I thank? And then they hurried off to work. Benny was puzzled. Why shouldn't Mrs. Green thank you for making the bagels, Grandpa? Grandpa picked Benny up onto the counter. Whoop! Benny, he asked. What are bagels made from? What are bagels made from? Flour. Very, very good. And then Grandpa said, where does flour come from? Ha, huh, that's a tough one. Where does flour come from? Wheat. That was excellent. And where does wheat come from? What do you guys think? From the earth. And who created the earth? God created the earth. So, Grandpa said, we thank God for our bagels. This is Grandpa talking to Benny. It was a good idea. Benny closed his eyes. Let's close our eyes really tight. Thank you, God, he whispered, for the bagels. And then Benny waited. 
Did God hear me, Grandpa? Who you ask difficult questions, said Grandpa. God always hears you. But Benny wasn't so sure. If God had heard him, why didn't God answer? At school that day, Benny could not concentrate. What's wrong, asked his teacher. What's wrong, asked his friends. I am thinking, said Benny. He was still thinking when he went to bed that night. Maybe God didn't answer me because I didn't ask God properly. Maybe there's some other way to thank God for the bagels. And Benny fell asleep. When he woke up in the morning, he had a great idea. Look at how happy he is that he had a great idea. He leaped out of bed, jumped out of bed, and ran down the stairs. Run, 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 run. That morning, Benny worked so hard in Grandpa's bakery. Grandpa, he asked, would you pay me a bag of bagels for my work? Grandpa raised his eyebrows. Why do you want a bag of bagels? Shh, said Benny. It's a surprise. Grandpa laughed and gave Benny a huge bag of bagels. Benny took them to the synagogue. This is where people speak to God, he thought. Maybe I can thank God properly here. Benny opened the door and peeked inside. It was very quiet and still. Maybe I shouldn't go in, he thought. It's not prayer time right now. But Benny took a deep breath and walked inside because everyone is always welcome. He tiptoed all the way up to the front. He climbed the stairs onto the bima, which is what we call the platform. And he opened the doors of the holy ark where we keep the Taurus. His heart was pounding. Everyone pound. Ba-boom. Ba-boom. He could barely breathe. Then he took a deep breath and put the bagels in the ark. Master of the universe, he said. I brought you some bagels. I know you make them, but you never taste them because Grandpa sells every last one. Benny put the bag in the ark and closed the doors. Thank you, God, for making the best bagels in town. And then he ran off to school. This is Benny putting the bagels in the ark. Well, on Shabbat, on Saturday, Benny and Grandpa went to the synagogue. Everyone prayed and sang, but not Benny. He was waiting to see what would happen when they opened the ark. When they opened the ark, the bagels were gone. I'm so glad you liked the bagels, God, said Benny. I'll bring you some more. And so every day that week, Benny worked so hard in Grandpa's bakery, and every day he crept into the synagogue and left the bagels in the ark. Look at that. Look at how many bagels he's leaving in the ark. Grandpa became curious. What was Benny doing with all of those bagels? So one day he followed Benny with the bagels after he left the bakery. He watched Benny go inside the synagogue. He watched Benny open the ark and put the bagels inside. And Grandpa said, what are you doing? You can't put bagels in the ark. And Benny said, but Grandpa, I've been putting bagels in the ark every day. And every week on Shabbat, they're gone. God must really, really love your bagels. Oh, Benny said Grandpa. God doesn't eat. God doesn't have a mouth or a stomach. God doesn't even have a body. 
Then where do all the bagels go? said Benny. I don't know, said Grandpa. Just then, they heard a creak at the front door. Benny and Grandpa ducked into the shadows. Duck into the shadows. In walked a man in a very tattered coat, and he opened the ark and took the bagels. Oh, God, he said. I was so hungry. For weeks, you have fed me. From heaven, you, God, have sent me such beautiful bagels. I have good news, said the poor man. I have finally found some work. So now I can feed myself and my family. And God, you can stop sending me these bagels. The man smiled quietly. You helped me, God. And now I promise to help others. And then he left. Oh, Benny was so upset. God didn't eat my bagels. A person took my bagels. Grandpa's eyes grew wide with wonder. Benny, you wanted to thank God? Yes, said Benny. Well, you did, said Grandpa. How, said Benny. Did you give bagels to someone who was hungry? Yes, said Benny. And did he promise to help other people? Yes, said Benny. Then you, Benny, made the world a better place. I did, said Benny. You did, said Grandpa. And what better thanks could God have? And Benny and Grandpa walked off in the snow. Thank you again for attending the Denver Interfaith Thanksgiving service. My name is Wayne Burvey, and I have been a board member here at the Tri-State Denver Buddhist Temple for the last 16 years. One of my favorite traditions that TSDBT has been involved in is the Denver Thanksgiving Interfaith Service. My family and I have enjoyed attending this service for 25 years. One of the main goals besides appreciating the, ver the diversity that brings us all together is using this event to help raise money for a charity and through our donations, improving the lives of those who are in need. This year's charity is the Struggle of Love Foundation. The following is a statement from this year's charity. During normal times, the Sacks of Love Food Pantry serves about 60 people a week who need a little extra help to get by. Now, multiply that steady stream of kindness by an astounding 40 times. In the last eight months since the pandemic began, the pantry continues to provide food boxes for more than 2,500 people a week, and that has not slowed down. As a result, the Struggle of Love Foundation created employment opportunities for youth and young adults to keep the pantry operating and to keep up with growing demand. The pantry operates five days a week for two hours each day and serves the greater Denver metro area. Although we focus on far northeast Montbello and Green Valley Ranch communities, everyone is welcome and we see our neighbors from all areas and all walks of life line up to receive food for the week. The Sex of Love operation has become one of the Foundation's main priorities. However, Struggle of Love still manages to continue facilitating youth programs, including camps, learning labs, the year-round sports and mentor program, secondary prevention, violence interruption, and community service obligations. We also pivoted to continue our, uh, to offer our annual community outreach events, which include the Father's Day Reach for Peace Picnic, Back to School Backpack and Supply Giveaway, Need to Feed Thanksgiving Basket Giveaway, and our Time to Give Holiday Gift Giving event. Since launching our drive through Sacks of Love Food Pantry, we have distributed over 500,000 pounds of food, which have helped feed over 70,000 individuals. 
We have also made over 1,000 deliveries to seniors, disabled individuals, and families without adequate transportation. To see our work in the community and or to get involved, please visit our website, struggleoflovefoundation.org. Please help us support our charity this year by donating through the link in the description below. Shalom, everybody. Hello, my name is Rabbi Joe Black. I'm the senior rabbi at Temple Emmanuel here in Denver. And I want to sing a song for you. And the song is called The God in Me. Thanksgiving is about giving thanks. In order for us to truly give thanks, we have to see the beauty in the world around us and also see the ugliness in the world around us so that we understand not only what we're thankful for, but what we need to do to make the world a better place. The song re references Moses on Mount Sinai seeing a bush that's burning and isn't being consumed. And the rabbis ask a question. How did Moses know that that bush was burning and wasn't being consumed? The text said, Moses said, I have to turn around and see this wondrous sight. The truth is, it takes a while to see if something is being consumed by fire. You have to really look at it. Moses' act of turning around forced him to look for the holiness in his life. Each of us at this time of Thanksgiving, at this difficult time of pandemic, of being isolated, of social distancing, need to find ways that we can give thanks. And that's what this service is about. That's what this day is about. But it has to go beyond this day. We need to look to find God everywhere we can. So the song is called, the God in me. Moses on a mountain saw a bush that was all aflame. He turned aside to look, then he heard God call his name. Was until he took the time for turning, he could see that bush was burning, and that was when he found his destiny. We all need to learn to take the time to turn around and see wonders that lie in our path oh the god in you the god in me huddled on a freeway ramp a battered cardboard sign she's hungry scared and homeless she hasn't got a dime The drivers in their cloistered cars Pretend that they don't see Too afraid to turn their heads and See her misery We all need to learn to take the time To turn around and see The ugliness that's in our path so God in you, the God in me. Turn away, we turn within. We hate to lose, we have to win. But if you turn, turn to see the God in you, the God in me. Oh, we are always in a hurry, can't afford to waste the time. Our heads are filled with worry, with every missed deadline. The rewards of all our labor, we believe, will set us free. 
Working is our passion. We can forsake our family. We all need to learn to take the time to turn around and see the loving that is in our lives. Oh, the God in you, the God in me. The God in you. Oh, the God in me. God in you and 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 me. God in me. Happy Thanksgiving. Good morning. I'm Reverend Clover Reuter Beal. I'm one of the co pastors at Montview Boulevard Presbyterian Church, and it is my great pleasure um, and privilege to be uh, part of this Thanksgiving service, this virtual service. Um, we're sorry not to be all together as we have been traditionally, but what a privilege to be with my colleagues from. Uh, all the religious traditions here in Denver um, that we can be connected by our hearts, that there are heart strings um, that connect us at this time. Um, and especially around this ritual and rite and um, moment of thanksgiving. In a very strange time, I keep thinking that uh, this is an opportunity to acknowledge that uh, we are filled with a strange joy, um, a paradox, a bittersweetness at this season of, of suffering and pain and loss and gratitude for the gifts and the blessings that lie uh, behind and under and around uh, this time in our in our country and in our world and in our own families uh, struggling. Um, to connect, to be connected. Um, I wanted to share with you one of the uh, meaningful traditions, sacraments in the Christian Church, uh, the and in as the Protestant Church, the sacrament of the Eucharist. We have two sacraments: baptism and the Eucharist, the uh, Lord's Supper. And at this time, I uh, I keep coming back to the common loaf that Jesus said in the in the supper the last supper before his death that he sat with the friends with his disciples and talked about being the bread of life that he himself was the bread of life and what that means for us that in that common loaf in that bread um, that we break together where it whether it be in our uh, Thanksgiving uh, table or in our daily uh, meals um, or in the mystical body of, of God. We share the common loaf of, of God in these common elements. So I think that the bread uh, reflects this mystery of our connection, of our humanity, of our interdependence, and um, of, our, of our common, uh, our destiny as humans, that we are um, dependent upon each other and that we need each other and that we must uh, focus on the metaphors and the uh, ways that we um, need, need each other and, and uh, are moving forward in this world and at this time together or or the stakes um, are high not to. I want to share with you one of the uh, writings from uh, a, a feminist theologian, Dr. Carter Hayward. 
and she wrote this piece. It's called uh, Blessing the Bread, the Rising of the Bread, and she wrote it for International Women's Year back in 1978, and it is one of my favorite uh, blessings of the bread, so I want to share this with you. In the beginning was God. In the beginning, the source of all that is. In the beginning, God yearning, God moaning, God laboring, God giving birth, God rejoicing. And God loved what she had made. And God said, it is good. And God, knowing that all good is shared, held the earth tenderly in her arms. God yearned for relationship. God longed to share the good earth. And humanity was born in the yearning of God. We were born to share the earth. In the earth was the seed. In the seed was the grain. In the grain was the harvest. In the harvest was the bread. In the bread was the power. And God said, all shall eat of the earth. All shall eat of the seed, all shall eat of the grain, all shall eat of the harvest, all shall eat of the bread, all shall eat of the power. God said, You are my people, my friends, my lovers, my sisters, my brothers. All of you shall eat of the bread and the power, all shall eat. Then God, gathering up her courage and love, said, Let there be bread. And God's sisters and brothers, God's friends and lovers, knelt on the earth, planted the seeds, prayed for the rain, sang for the grain, made the harvest, cracked the wheat, pounded the corn, kneaded the dough, kindled the fire, filled the air with the smell of fresh bread, and there was bread, and it was good. We, the brothers and sisters of God, say today, all shall eat of the bread and the power. We say today, all shall have power and bread. Today we say, let there be bread, let there be power, let us eat of the bread and the power, and all will be filled, for the bread is rising. By the power of God, God's children are blessed. By the children of God, the bread is blessed. By the bread of God, the power is blessed. By the power of bread, the power of children, the power of God, the people are blessed. The earth is blessed and the bread is rising. I pray that you will feel the power of the people of God that you are connected um, with, that we are all connected together. And may this Thanksgiving Day we uh, hold each other in our hearts and hold each other as we break bread um, together, even though we are not in the same space. May God bless you. Hi, good morning everyone. Thank you for joining us again this year for yet another Interfaith Thanksgiving service. This one being the 2020 edition. Now I'm sure there are many of you joining us today who have been to these services over the years. And as you know, each year we travel to a different host location in order to sort of get the feel of their space and to share together with their members all of these beautiful Thanksgiving prayers and traditions. This year, as you can see, we are with Tri-State Denver Buddhist Temple, and we are supposed to be the hosts. Unfortunately, as per everything right now, we are unable to get together in person which is really too bad because part of this whole service is being able to gather in Thanksgiving with other members of different faith traditions, including their religious leaders. So usually I would be up here with all of them sharing that space, but as we all know, this is not something we can do this year. 
Uh, we decided this year that the theme was going to be perseverance and thanksgiving. And I think largely this kind of has become the theme for the year 2020 in general. We have all had to change practically everything about the way that we do things and everything about our lives in general. And it's very, very hard. I know a lot of us are really trying to find things that we can be thankful for. And I try to look at things like the fact that we have this wonderful technology that allows us to even though we can't gather in person, to stay connected with each other and to be able to do services like this regardless of what is going on outside. And while I'm still thankful for that, we all know that nothing quite replaces being able to be physically with somebody whether it's just sitting next to them, being able to give them a hug or just hold their hand or just be near them in general. And so when we look at this year, we have to remember that there are things we can be thankful for, but it's very, very difficult for everyone. And the thing I think that we should be most thankful for this year is the fact that we have indeed been able to persevere. We have been able to ride out to the best of all of our abilities, despite the economic anxieties we feel, despite the fear that we may feel for loved ones because we don't want them or ourselves to get sick. We can see that there's a lot of social upheaval that has happened this year. And some of these things are good changes. They're teaching us things little by little, but all of it has been very difficult because as Buddhists, we know 100% change is one of the biggest causes of our disease or our suffering as human beings. And yet, we must remember once again, the biggest thing we have to be thankful for is that we persevere. The year is almost over, guys. We can do this. Now, the story behind our particular temples, the Jodo Shinshu temples, which are part of the Buddhist churches of America, but also part of the long, larger organization, the Jodo Shinshu Honganji Ha, Nishi Honganji Ha in Kyoto, Japan. Now, our temples um, and members came over in the late 1800s. And this was with sort of the first big wave of Japanese immigrants. Now it was the immigrants themselves, their children, their grandchildren, their great grandchildren that are the reason that we have the temples that we have in the United States today. And they being a group of immigrants persevered through a lot. The initial wave had to deal with things like alien land laws that made it impossible for um, certain generations to own land. And one of the biggest things that happened um, through these generations was in 1942, February 19th, um, 1942, the President of the United States issued Executive Order 9066, which required that all persons of Japanese ancestry be rounded up and put into internment camps for the duration of the war. Now, I could go into explanations, but you guys all have computers, obviously, so you can look up all of the details. But the reason I bring this up is because I have a Sangha member who has since passed, but um, long ago told me this story um, of his family's travel to Colorado from Los Angeles. Now, right before the order was issued, there was, they were calling it a voluntary evacuation of the people of Japanese ancestry from the West Coast. If someone had a friend or family living somewhere else who could be sort of a sponsor, you were, um, encouraged to leave the West Coast and to travel there. And this particular member of mine had people here in the state of Colorado, which was good not only so they could get off of the West Coast, but also because our darling governor at the time, Governor Ralph Carr, had issued an edict and said very, very straightforward that he did not find any of this behavior to be constitutional and that as citizens of the United States, citizens should be able to move about freely and live where they want. And so he openly 
welcomed the Japanese and Japanese Americans into the state of Colorado. And again, another person I would encourage you to look up. Uh, he's all over the place. You'll see him at the Capitol, et cetera, et cetera. But he was a wonderful man and a politician of the like I wish we could have even for 10 minutes at this point would be lovely. But um, this member of mine told me that on February 8th, 1942, uh, at one in the morning, he and his family packed up their little car and headed out from Los Angeles to the state of Colorado. Well, people in other states had been informed that the Japanese were leaving the West Coast, and so every time they hit a border and every time they hit a town, they were greeted with um, people throwing garbage at their car, and this member happened to be 13 years old at the time. Garbage was thrown at the car. People yelled, we don't want you Japs. They painted it on their storefronts and on their homes. And so there was nowhere where they were being welcomed. At one point, he said at some place in New Mexico, their car was detained as part of the caravan. And his mother, who spoke very little English, was brought in and interrogated. So as a young 13-year-old boy, this guy had to go in and try to interpret for his mother while she was being interrogated. And so again, at every place they tried to stop, they were greeted with all of the, or not greeted, but they were met with all of this extreme hatred and this fear. And finally, they get from New Mexico and they see the Colorado border and they see the Colorado State Patrol. And his brother, his older brother who was driving the car, pulls over to the side of the road because they figure, here we go again, you know, state patrol at the border, they're going to search our car. So they pull over, they get out, they get ready to do the whole search when the Border Patrol, as it were, comes up to the car and walks over to the two young men and the rest of the family in the car and says, welcome folks to Colorado. On behalf of Governor Carr and the state of Colorado itself, we'd like to welcome you home. So in thinking of all of this perseverance that this member and his family went through, I myself think of how lucky I am to be here now. His family got to Colorado, they built a life, they helped build and maintain our temples, build and maintain our sangha and our traditions, and through all of this, they gained great strength. They've inspired myself and many of our members to also maintain what we've got, but also to find the strength to persevere as they did. Because as we realize that there are so many people that are the reason that we are here today, we can express great gratitude to them, not only for continuing to maintain the things that we have, but also teaching us that strength in perseverance. Because when we find our own strength through that, we are also able to help others find their own. And through that, all of us will be able to join together, to persevere together, and to come out much stronger than we were. So thank you all for coming this morning. Hopefully next year it will be in person. And I'm going to close today with the words of our founder, Shinran Shonin. Please join me in Gasho. Without discrimination, I'll share with everyone Amida's precious gift, and together we will travel to the Pure Land. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Naman. Thank you for joining us for this year's Denver Thanksgiving Interfaith Service. We appreciate everyone joining us today, together in fellowship and with acknowledgement of coexistence. The stories of perseverance and thanksgiving from each group gives us common grounds to move forward during this challenging and unprecedented time. Please enjoy a safe Thanksgiving and holiday season. We are excited to announce that next year's Thanksgiving Interfaith Service will be hosted by the Montview Boulevard 
Presbyterian Church. We hope all of you will be there in person so we can enjoy each other's company then. Thank you. Kasha. Sure.